and this is the intro and i'm your host gus summers good to be back with you today we got another great show we have a great in-studio guest he is actually calling in from one of those exotic locations that he often goes to he is known as global henry mr henry biernacki henry how are you today i'm doing well sir how are you mr gus summers <laughs> i'm doing great thank you for taking the time i know you you're an author a world traveler a pilot an explorer you've been to all those great places that most people just dream about <laughs> well first of all thank you for having me on the in show it's a pleasure and i want to thank steve snikert for getting me this and making sure you and i hooked up finally because it's been a while that we've been trying to do this so i appreciate you even having me out here um to do this the end show sir oh you know it, it's my pleasure yeah steve is a, is a great friend of the end show great kudos uh, to him for uh you know hooking us up uh, definitely and you know just want to jump right into it you've you know we we talked off air I've, I've seen uh, some of the things that uh, Steve has sent over, some of the places you've been to, the people you've met, and this has been a lifelong, I don't know, e exploration for you. Am I correct? How young were you when you first went on your, uh, your first journey? My first time that I went away alone was 17 years old. I took a bus from Colorado Springs down to the border of Mexico, then into Chihuahua, into the city of Chihuahua, all the way down to Guadalajara. And all in all, I probably spent about 50 hours, five zero hours on the bus and getting off the bus and staying in different cities. And so 17 years old was the first time that I'd spent outside the U.S. And my mom and dad were wondering where I was going, and I told them I had my passport and I was going down to Mexico. <laughs> they, they had no idea what was going on or why I was doing it, and it has become a lifelong passion and as you said some are some exotic places that most people dream about going to and other places are places that people don't even want to go to and I find myself now going to as most random as I can a location even going to the airport and just looking at the destination of departure boards and saying I want to go there and that's how I pick my my cities and countries now you know that you know, that's I mean that's a fascinating uh adventure that you always have what caused you to want to go on that first adventure did you see a movie were you did you see indiana jones and just wanted to be like that or did, your magazine what was it what was that first just inkling uh, for that's you? a great question it really is since uh when i was young and i was in pennsylvania and i would hear people that were coming in from different parts i'd hear the french canadian speaking french or i'd hear somebody speaking spanish and being eight years old i would ask what is that? I mean, it's different languages, where are they from? And then I would look at the world map. And when I was eight years old, I was, I was like always telling myself, I want to go to these places and see what they're about. Because these people are obviously in the place where I'm born and raised, and why can't I go and see where they're born and raised? And it began when I was that young that I felt that I could do that, and it would just take a amount of time. And then when people feel like they cannot afford it, I did it at a time when it was probably not conducive to me being able to afford it, but I still did it, and I did it very cheaply at the same time. Right. You know, you know, you're 17, and you know, most most 17 year olds are thinking about you know head cheerleaders, prom dates, and what have you. Here you are going down to a, a different country. How, how did that impact you in in those you know those teenage years and into your 20s and such? When I was 17, I was offered a spot on a traveling baseball team in Colorado that would travel all through the U.S., and that's what I really wanted to go to school for in university was baseball or wrestling or something to get a scholarship. But then when somebody offered me to go down to Mexico and live with a family, I actually turned down that baseball traveling team, and I went down to Mexico. And I think that was a turning point because I always felt I could continue to play baseball I was young enough where I could play in high school and university, but I might not have the opportunity to then go back to Mexico or have the opportunity to go to Mexico as I was going to when I was 17. And so that's what I did is I decided at that time, and it probably took a different path, but then later on I actually played in the Mexican Baseball League. So I was still playing baseball later on 
many years down the road that I had the opportunity to go back to Mexico and live and go to university there, study languages, and still play baseball. And so at 17, most people, like you said, are going out and having a good time and learning about their schools and all that. And I just felt I wanted to learn more about the world and begin setting my sights on seeing more of the world and learning what the world was about and how I was going to be fitting into the world. Right. And when, when you got down to Mexico, how was that? You know, I'm sure there was uh, some culture shock. Was it uh, vastly different from your personal experience, or was it what you were expecting? I believe at that time, that at 17, there's not many preconceived notions that one carries. And I remember, I thought it was going to be a lot warmer than it was, and I was on all-night buses, and I was freezing. Because I didn't have any really <laughs> warm clothes, because I thought I heard Mexico, and you always think warm, warm, warm. But all my bus rides definitely get cold <laughs> and so that was the one thing I wasn't prepared for is the chilliness of the night and waking up to the fog as the driver literally was I was as I've written before trying to set the land speed record <laughs> going through fog and so the good thing is when somebody is not I guess I guess naive and since I was so naive, I didn't know what to expect and have any preconceived notions. And that's the good thing is now I try to go to places where I don't have an idea what's going to happen or should happen. And that's often the best outcome. Wow. Right. Right. Because you, you go in there feeling open and ready for an experience instead of being lim limiting yourself to what you thought it would be like. Exactly. And that's when people ask me, where, oh, where should I go, Henry? And I'm like, well, I don't want to say too much because then they're going to create this image or this experience before they've even gone physically. And that's the limiting experience that they might have already. So I typically ask, do you like water, food, mountains, people, museums? And then I say, okay, well, go to one of these places in, in, around the world, but I can't really tell you what kind of experience you're going to have. I always tell people, just go with the experience of openness and something's going to hit you. And I think it's always going to be a positive, even if flights cancel, lose things, look at it as that's out of your control, and things out of your control, we just change our attitudes on how we view it. Wow, very nice. So when when you when you got down there, did you speak Spanish a little bit, or did they speak English? How, how was that? How was your trip while you were actually there? Well, I thought I spoke Spanish. Like most people think they speak another language. <laughs> then I realized I really need to focus on how to speak languages. And that was the probably the the on-off switch for me about learning language, that communicating, 80% is nonverbal, but the other percentage, I have to be able to speak. And I came back to the U.S. and really, really focused on learning languages. And to me, the languages of the world, for the United Nations, if they're in a session, a big or small session, they always translate English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Russian, and Mandarin. Those six languages are probably if you go anywhere in the world you're not going to you are not going to have a problem typically on how to communicate and so i set my sights out on the french and spanish right away and because french people think french is a not an important language but it very much is the documents in europe are translated into french and english there's 35 francophone countries which is their first language is french around the world so it's a very important language and to me, I felt that it was going to be my second language, and that's when I started concentrating on French, and then another language came, and so it was just one of those things that, it was an on and off switch that I, I realized at an early age that I needed to be able to speak other languages in order to do what I wanted to do in life. Right, right. So, so when you were there, and uh, t tell me about the experience with the people, you know, you, you show up, you hear someone from Colorado, what city did you end up going to first? I went to El Paso. Well, I took a bus, Greyhound bus, on I-25 South through Las Cruces and then El Paso, and I crossed into Ciudad Juarez, and then I took a four-hour bus ride into Chihuahua City, and then I continued on south, and I just kept going. And the people I met, they were almost in awe that somebody would be willing, no matter what age, to step outside of their comfort zone and be willing to be hit with experiences without trying to control them and the outcome. And what I discovered is that they were, they'd almost take me under their wings or treat me as a brother or a son. 
and say, okay, we're going to show him what we need him to learn about in this city. And I, by not having an itinerary at that time and just going, that's when I started learning that, hey, I don't need to control the outcome. I don't need to control the path. As long as I'm open, I'm going to have an experience that's very unique. Right, right. And, and so where did you finally stop? At what city? In Guadalajara. Oh, Guadalajara. Okay. Yes. And what made you stop there? Was that the end of the bus line, or you know, you thought this was a good place? Yeah, I just, it was one of those things. I, I, I looked at the map, and I was like, well, I'm really far from the border. And, and it was, at 17, that's pretty far from your mind of being in Colorado. I was 50, mile, 50 hours south. of I've been traveling for hours and hours, stopping along the way. But, and it was just a point where I was like, okay, I might have to make my way back because I had to begin school. I think I was going to be a junior or senior that year and so I I was like maybe I have to make my way back because it's already August and if I can delay it anymore who knows how long it'll take me to get back and that's the one I, I believe the thought I've always had you can continue to go and ramble but I always have the balance of I have to constantly you as a modern human you still have to have an income you have to go to school be productive and so you can get carried away with the process and just lose sight of everything and just keep constantly be a vagabond. Right, right. So that was really a, so it was an eye-opening experience and it was also a learning experience for you to see how your future could possibly unfold before you in a certain manner. Yes, very much so. The I had no idea what I was actually, 20 years, 30 years down the road, what I would still be doing or even want to do because everything changes. But that one idea of constantly seeing what was over the next horizon uh, was, it clicked at that time as well, that I wanted to constantly explore. And however I went about doing that, that was going to be uh, the, I guess, the trick, the interesting step for me on how would I add this to my life and not just let it be a portion of my life and look back and say, oh, I did this at one time, but constantly be doing it. Wow, fantastic. And a great story. I mean, great, a great experience. We've got to take a quick commercial break. So I'm excited to find out about some of the other people you met and places that you've been. What, in a, what a modern day Indiana Jones you are. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break. So hang in there. Hey, well, this is Gus Summers, and you're listening to The In Show. And we have in-studio guest, Mr. Henry Birnacki, and he's talking about his globe trekking early days, and we're going to get into some of his other trekkers uh, or trek trips in just a little bit. So you hang in there. We'll be right back. And this is The In Show. And I'm your host, Gus Summers. Good to be back with you today. We got another great show. That's right. We have the global Henry in studio, he is calling in from a wonderful location right now. Am I correct, Henry? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's coming through quite well, so I appreciate, again, this is a great opportunity to speak to you on the air, and hopefully the listeners are enjoying it as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just, um, you know, going through your website and, you know, seeing all the all the places that you've been, you know, that alone is uh, that's exciting, you know, to find out, wow, that you had the opportunity to do this at such an early age, well, you know, th that brings in actually, because I kind of wanted to uh, pick up right there. You said you were, you were 17, junior, uh, senior in high school. How did you convince your parents to let you go, you know, hundreds of miles away into another country? Yeah, I, I think at that time, uh, that young, and my parents were probably just as naive as I was to think, <laughs> oh, he's just going to go on a trip, he'll come back. He'll realize the world's out there and he'll come running back home. But I, again, it's one of those things they didn't really focus on what could happen. And I think they just trusted me to be able to go out there and handle whatever was going to occur. Although it's, it's a big thing for parents to allow their kids that, uh, to do. And I told them, I was like, I want to go to Mexico. I want to start exploring. I want to go to see what our neighbors are like. I want to go to start speaking Spanish really well. And they told me they were like well, where's your passport and I had already received it I got it and from the post office and they were like well he's obviously been trying to and this is before the internet and all that stuff so <laughs> this is way before then and I, I had nothing really except a, a bus ticket to the border and then from there I was going to go 
and so I appreciate that they had the confidence in themselves to let their son go and explore because this is the result now as I'm constantly doing it. Right. All right. Wow. What, what, what uh, you know, a great story. You know, you can hear that conversation going any which way, but it sounds like it, w- it went, uh, you know, very nicely. And they yes. gave you the confidence and the encouragement that you needed to go down there with, uh, with the love and support you needed, it seems. Definitely so. And to this day, I was in, um, a week ago, I was in uh, uh, Asuncion in Paraguay, and I called my parents, and they're like, oh, where you're at? And I tell them I'm in Paraguay, and they're like, oh, yeah. They're pretty used to it now that I'm calling from a remote location, going to see Iguazu, the waterfalls down there in Brazil, in Argentina. But before, they would say, okay, we just got to w- wonder where he's going, and there's certain places I went to North Korea and I did not tell them until I flew back to China from North Korea where I stayed 10 days, 12 days. I don't tell them certain places just because I know they would be worrying. And again, it's I didn't worry going into certain places, but I just know they, they're going to waste their energy worrying. Right, right. So let me uh, let me get back to your, your story. So you, you come back. Uh, you're you're in high school. So, what's your next trip? Do you go right away? Do you? I know you eventually go to a university yes. and study. And did you just real quick uh, athletics? I know you were saying that was a big thing. Did you go on a, a, a sports scholarship? I did not. I I really wanted to go play baseball or wrestle at Harvard. Yes. And I really really tried to get into Harvard. And I didn't get accepted, so I went to a small Division three school and played football and baseball there. And I, right then, I, I decided to... I could have gone Division one, where the academics weren't as strong, but I really wanted the academics, and that's why I pushed for Harvard so hard. And Princeton, but I didn't get accepted, so I went Division three ac- academics, where I had an a- academic scholarship part, and then I had to pay for the rest. And I had four older sisters, so my mom and dad were saying, no, we're not going to pay for anything. You go, you pay. And so immediately, I, my first weekend, I declared a major of French and Spanish and International Affairs. And they were reluctant to accept that because they said, oh, you're too young. You're not going to keep it. I said, no, I'm studying languages. <laughs> That's simple. I mean, uh, whatever I have to do, I'm studying languages. And so you can accept the, my declaration of my what we call romance languages, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and Romanian, or you can wait. And they, they accepted it, and so I started taking classes right away for that. And so I played football and baseball my freshman year, and then the next year I had an opportunity to go study in Mexico. And that's when I went back to Mexico and began studying and living with families, and that's when I played in the Mexican leagues as well, baseball. Okay. So, so your next trip was when you were in college? Yeah, and I went back s- slightly in between the uh, in between university, but not too long. I'd say a couple months at a time. But when I went back to live was in university. Oh, okay. And how was that experience? Now, constantly one of growth. Where you, <laughs> I always ask myself, what am I doing? What is this? What am I trying to receive from this? And is it going to add to my life, or is it just going to be one of those things that comes and goes? And uh, and I constantly allowed it to add to my life where I would allow all the experiences to aggregate and then try and have it move me towards more of learning about the world. Right. Now, in, in, with, uh, in, in that journey, and all your journeys, have you, uh, I'm sure you've developed some uh, relationships there with the people. Did you, have you come away with like some best friends or people that you, you know, you constantly contact again just because you grew so close to them during those journeys? And what's interesting is when you are a traveler, no matter who you are, whatever they see first, you represent that type of person. So obviously I'm speaking about race, and so I look like a certain way, so I'm representing whoever looks like me. And then they find out where you're from, so then you're also representing your nationality. And so that's what I've really learned, excuse me, is that these people see you a certain way, then they see your nationality, and so you're almost a, an unofficial, so to speak, <laughs> a ambassador that you want to represent in a positive way. And so along the way, I've met wonderful people that I am still in contact with. I actually have a godchild in Mexico when I was playing down there. The manager of the baseball team asked me to be the godfather. And then people from all over the world, from Colombia to Nepal. I wish, I, I mean, I have friends in North Korea, but you, I cannot contact them. But uh, the... the 
the Netherlands, France, when I lived over in France, my host family. After 120 or 130 countries, I've lost count, but there are relationships that are very strong, and I believe when somebody travels, there's not really the time to try and get to know each other. You're just thrown into getting to know each other. So the relationships are a little bit more firm and solid. Right. right. You know, and, you know with, with your travels, so you, you at 17, you go to Mexico, a few trips in between, and then you go while in, in college, you go down there for a longer period of time. Now, you're out of college, or where does the real trekking begin in your mind? Is that after college when you start going to all these different locations, or did it start at 17? It, I guess at 17 when I began that slight journey, and I allowed it to continue, and then when I went to back to Mexico to live, then I went to France to live and study, it continued to progress and build a foundation of sorts, if you will. And when I graduated university, I had a lot of student loans, and I had $3,700, and the rest of the money I was saving up was a monthly payment towards student loans. So I asked my mom and dad, can you just send this off one one a month until I come back? And they thought $3,700 would not last somebody very long, but I learned quickly that I could sleep on the streets and still shave, still look appropriate, but nobody really knew where I was sleeping. So I'd sleep on the streets around the world, and... That year, 1997, was more of a turning point to say, okay, I can pretty much do this at a very low cost. Although extreme for some people, it wasn't extreme for me. I wanted to see the world, and I had to do that with minimal, minimal money. And that's when I would say it all began when I was 17. The foundation was set, and then the studying abroad, it was beginning of a, more of a hardcore, so to speak, exploration. And that's at 1997. Yeah, I went around the world sleeping in the streets and spending $3,700 that year. <laughs> 37 and And tell me some of the places that you went to. I went through Eastern Europe, all of Russia. I took a train from Moscow to Beijing. I went into Hong Kong for the handover from the British to the Chinese in 97 in July. Nepal, India. And in India, I was with Mother Teresa three days before she passed away. We had mass together. We had breakfast together. We spoke for 30 minutes. And uh, honestly, it was one of those, tr I was able to get in the Cannes Film Festival. I met somebody on a train and because I speak French, the guy was like, oh, where'd you learn French? And I told him he invited me home for 18 days. It was just one of those journeys that just kept manifesting into something else, into something else. And the people became my monuments rather than buildings or museums. Wow, amazing, amazing. So how did you end up meeting Mother Teresa? Was that something you planned, or did it just kind of work itself out that way? As most things, when I travel, I try not to plan. I really try not to because people are going to guide you by saying, oh, you should go here, and thus I go there, and wonderful things happen. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I ended up in India, and I knocked on the door at 5 in the morning, and that's when Mass was in session, and I walked upstairs, and I literally was sitting 10 feet from her, and after Mass, Sister Nirmala told me to come back at 10 in the morning, and then I could visit with Mother Teresa, and I did. I walked around the city of Calcutta until 10 in the morning, and I walked back, and I made sure there was only like 10 people in line to even talk, speak to her, wow. and then three days later, millions of people showed up, but I mean, life happens to those who show up, and I could have just as easily kind of put it aside and said, Don, I don't need to go meet her. Uh, I was in mass with her, but I went back. And yes. that's probably one of the most things I've ever, I keep to the forefront of my thought is life happens to those who show up. Right. And we may not want to, but when you don't want to do something, the best outcome is often that you go and do it anyways. Right, fantastic. And w w if I may ask, uh, if you'd like to share, what was it that she said to you? She asked where I was from, and I told her my godmother was a nun, and I'd spent a lot of time in the convent in Pennsylvania with nuns, and she kind of had a giggle at that. <laughs> she asked why I was traveling, why I'd want to leave uh, home to go and learn, and my response was pretty much like the reason she did. She just wanted to go out and meet people, and, to, and her glow, and her body was frail. She was 87, but her eyes, when she looked at you, could literally grab you and hug you without even touching you. Right, they had. She that, was very intense. Right, they had that, that 
piercing quality to them. Yes, wow. very much so. And it was almost like talking to anybody that she was very humble, but her eyes, she had no questions about what she was doing in life, if it was right or wrong. She can, she really truly believed in what she was doing, right. and you could sense that. Yeah. She didn't have a question about anything. It felt like she was very calm. Right. Did she she bless you on your journeys there? She did. I bent over. I bent down, and she touched me on the side of my head and one on my forehead, and she gave me two medals of Virgin Mary and told me to be safe and continuously to explore and enjoy what the world was. Wow. Wow. A blessing from Mother Teresa. What a, what a way to end this segment. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Henry. Now we know why your journeys have been so uh, blessed, I guess we can say. Definitely. <laughs> I, I definitely say that I've been blessed in having, I mean, I've always, I've had some negative things, but I've had sure. blessings even in those things. Yeah, absolutely. Henry, we got to take a, a quick commercial break, but fantastic fantastic. What a, what a way to uh, end the segment. Appreciate you. you taking the time. You bet. Hey, well, this is Gus Simmons, and you're listening to The In Show. And we have in-studio guest, the global Henry, Mr. Henry Birnacki. And we just learned that Mother Teresa, just a few days before she passed, blessed him. What a great, great experience. And thank him for sharing that. Hey, so we're going to take a quick commercial break. So you hang in there, and we'll be right back. And this is The In Show. And I'm your host, Gus Summers. Good to be back with you today. That's right. We got in studio Henry Bernanke. And he's been sharing his wonderful experiences with us. We left off where he, just a few days before Mother Teresa passed, had the opportunity to talk with her. And she blessed him on the way. Uh, Henry, of, I think of there are probably a few people in modern times that maybe the entire world would, would have wanted to meet, and she was definitely someone I think everyone would have at least liked to have seen from a distance or be in the same room, and you actually had the opportunity to meet with her and have her bless you. Wow, that what a fantastic, fantastic journey that one was. But I know you've done so much more. I know you are also an author, you're a pilot, you do so much. T tell me about your books, because I like what you were saying about that. Well, I, as, when I began writing 20-some years ago, I never thought I would be writing novels or articles or anything of fiction. And what I've learned is I try to bring the world closer to people that may or may not have the opportunity to, to travel. So I, I write in fiction, but the geographical settings are very accurate. But I put characters in there, and I'm not writing about myself but I want to bring the world closer to people that may not be able to travel. And that's one thing I've learned is I don't want to focus on me in my travels. I just write them, but it's all about the world and the people I meet. And I might put fictional characters in, nonfiction characters. I, I always combine things, but the geographical setting is very accurate because people are interested in what is the world like outside of their realm of everyday life. And that's the one thing I've really tried to do in my writing is bring the world to the people rather than trying to promote what I'm doing. It's I'm bringing the world right to their backyard. And, and when, you, when you first you know, started writing, was it more a, a cathartic type of event that you just wanted to you know, get this out because so much was happening to you? Or did you really want to you know, share it with people so they can, in a manner, go with you on your travels? At the beginning, I probably tried to catch everything because I felt everything, every moment that I was doing was important, but it wasn't. It, there's just, the background is what matters and the subtleties of what traveling is, and I have to bring those out. And when people travel, we tend to learn more about ourselves through the world. And there's a lot of thoughts that go people, through people's minds and the, the discussions we have with people from all over the world as, as a traveler does. And so my writing does a little bit more of a poeticness to it, a little bit of philosophy and what traveling does and sleeping on the streets or going to see these parts of the world that are so hidden. And so my writing has dialogue, but it, I've been, it's been referred to as very poetic as well. And I do believe that's the joy of traveling in the way that I do travel. It's, it's poetry is in motion continuously. It's an invasion of your senses and traveling does do that right how, how many books have you written thus far one is published
published and I have another one that's complete. It's going through some editing right now and another one that's about 75% done and then about three others that are about 50% done. So a total right now, I try to write as, not one only, but I try to write three or four at a time just in case, because three of them, no, four of them actually are with one character and then the other three, two are not. Yeah, they're just different characters, but one's published and that's called No More Heroes and the other ones are, I'd say one probably in the next year another one will be published and that is about the Russian steppe, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, all the Stans, what we call the Commonwealth of Independent States of Old Russia. Oh, okay, and, and you had an opportunity to visit many of those, I'm sure? Yes, I have, and just the uniqueness of that area with the Silk Road into China, yes. and that's what I wanted to write about. It's a little bit of the history and almost like a parallel time with my main character of him meeting certain people on, along the way and yeah, most importantly bring out the history of that area uh-huh. it's such a unique area I, I re- truly enjoy it yes and you know as as your you know your stories come along you're building your character who's he based on is he just a a, a combination of just various experiences that you put into one person? Is he slightly based uh, on you? Tell me a little bit about the lead character. Well, in No More Heroes, it's just, uh, it's not based on me at all. Uh, but people tend to, that know me, they're like, well, Nicholas is my main character, and my father's name is Nicholas. So I think it's a very artistic yet strong name. And my nephew's name is Nicholas. And so I try to use names of people that I know. I have friends from all over the world, and one in uh, the Netherlands, his name is Ben Vanderhaar, and I have another friend named uh, Andrew Gopsel, so I, I put Ben Vandergopsel, I put those together. So the characters are put uh, from other people that I've met, uh, a melange of people, a collage of people, if you will, and that's how I definitely try to build my characters. And that way you, you it's a sense of reality because you can get... Even if you watch them on the street, you could put them with a character. Oh, I like the way this person dressed or walked or spoke. And so there, there is a realism to the characters, but it could be many, many different people into this one character. But Nicholas is just a young kid in this one book that I wrote of No More Heroes, and he meets a lady who's in her 80s um, named Foxy, and they share life experiences, talk about traveling, Walt Whitman, uh, the Bay Area and Nepal, and in the book, Nicholas thinks he's adding to her life because she's never really traveled but only read about it. But he's actually, at the end, realized that she's added so much more to his life. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. And this is the, the main character in your other books as well, right? Yes. Four out of the six, Nicholas is in the main character of the books. Wow. And so we see him, I'm assuming, evolve and change through each each book. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And this book of No More Heroes, it's actually book three of the four. I okay. wrote four with Nicholas, and I wanted to release this one because it was more about the people that Nicholas was meeting, and rather than it was about Nicholas. My other ones are more about Nicholas on how he began traveling, and he lost all his money on gambling, and then he went to North Korea, and on his way back, he was in Seattle, and he jumped on a flight to get back to the Bay Area, and that's where book three comes in, that's No More Heroes, but it all began, and all the book titles are actually in No More Heroes, I just wrote them all at the same time, and this one just happened to finish first. Ah, uh, gotcha. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. You can't you know, look forward to the whole series uh, when it slowly rolls out. You know, also, yes. you know, also want to ask you about uh, being a pilot. You are also a, uh, a pilot, and how does that, besides the obvious, work into your globe trekking? Do you, uh, are you able to schedule yourself to go somewhere and then you stay longer, or is it uh, you just plan that differently? On my days off, we bid a schedule, a monthly schedule, for the airline that I'm currently with, which is Virgin America. Great airline, great people, and it's my sixth airline, and I never really set out to be an airline pilot, but when I came back from 97, I thought to myself, the best way to do it is work for an airline. <laughs> and so <laughs> I slept in a van, went to flight school after flight school, and, and I kept getting more and more ratings and continued on the path of just learning how to be a better pilot and a safer pilot. And through the jobs, it just took me to the, where I'm at now. And so you can bid a schedule, a monthly schedule, and you can get several days off in a row. And with that, you can 
take the time to go out wherever you need to and go explore. And it's really been a blessing that A, I have the health, because you have to have a medical and make sure you're still healthy. Otherwise, if you can't fly, you're not going to be having a first class medical. So it, the, uh, as I said, my sixth airline, I flew overseas for a number of years with a foreign carrier and another carrier overseas. And that's the, I, again, it's one of these things that I've never really planned the destination. Uh, and it just so happened that I'm now an airline pilot and it's probably the best thing I could have ever ha- hoped for. Wow. Uh, so do you, do you um, get into conversations with some of the pilots? Do you know some of the pilots when you take flights? Yes. We, we, it's not often that you get to fly with the same crew member. And you do every now and then, so it's good. You build a rapport and a great relationship with them. And... I'm really good friends with some of the guys here at Virgin, and I travel with one guy named Doug Nichols. I've traveled with him a few times, but typically I travel alone. And that's the good thing is when you get to spend time with your friends, and you're you're at 38,000 feet, and if you're flying six hours, all you do is visit and you catch up, and obviously you're flying the airplane, you're maintaining the safety of the airplane, but you still can speak and talk. So that's the good thing is that, we, we often say we're solving the world problems up there. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, wow. Well, what a what a great way to travel with friends and going to exotic destinations. Henry, we've got to take a quick break, but you know, again, you know, thank you for sharing your stories. Fantastic. My pleasure. Thank you. Hey, well, this is Gus Summers, and you're listening to the In Show, and we have in studio guest Mr. Henry Birnacki, the Global Henry. And we're going to have more of him in our last segment. So you hang in there. We'll be right back. And this is The In Show. And I'm your host, Gus Summer. It's good to be back with you today. That's right. We have in-studio guest, Mr. Henry Birnanke, the global Henry. Henry, we haven't even scratched the surface of all that you have seen and uh, done all these many years. But I uh, do want to give you a chance to mention any uh, websites, any upcoming events, any special trips that you might be taking. Well, excellent, yes. The website is called theglobalhenry.com, and I post some articles and some photos on there. But my the book, if you want to read the reviews, most important, the reviews about the, the novel that is out in about three and a half years now. So there's reviews on there. But, uh, again, I... Uh, People have helped me along the way. Steve Schneider, my publicist, and he's always there. He's he's reading my work, telling me what's good and what's bad. Get rid of it. <laughs> and two people also, Lisa and Nancy, they're on a basically a U.S. tour of all the state parks, and they help me with my website. And again, they tell me what's good and what's bad, and get rid of it, keep it. So everybody, uh, Big Blend Radio, uh, they're on their state park U.S. tour. And they're doing some wonderful things. And the reason I mention them is because they're also exploring. They're getting outside their comfort zone and really, truly enjoying what they're doing. Right. And your book, it, it can be found in Amazon.com, I'm assuming, and a few other places? Yes. If people have the ebook, the Nook, the Kindle uh, on their phones, that's probably, people always ask for price, so that's probably the cheapest way to go about it if you want to download it. And obviously, Amazon bookstores may or may not carry it. I've learned that no matter how big or small the bookstore is, they can order it, but not every bookstore will carry every book. It's right. just unheard of. So they can order it. It's, again, called No More Heroes, and uh, or you can order it uh, online through Amazon, all the online distributors, Barnes & Noble as well. But it's it, the good thing is it's accessible, and most things are through the Internet these days. Right. If anybody is listening that would like to uh, correspond via email, please go to the website and ask questions. Uh, the only way we learn is by asking. Nothing's a dumb question. I definitely agree that you have to ask in order to learn. I ask people all over the world, what do I need to do? Where's the bus from yes. the airport to the city? Nice. That's, those are the smallest questions, but they get you a lot of the beginning, the opening to enter a country. Fantastic. You know, we, we just have a few more minutes. Uh, what are your plans now? What's, uh, what's the plan for the rest of the year and next year? Where are some of the places you're going to? The good thing about October, I usually take a vacation. I take all of October off and I go and travel because October, people are back in school. Travel's cheap. Nobody's traveling. And it's great weather. 
above the equator, below the equator. Yes. It's before winter, it's before summer. It's just a changing season. And I think October and November, beginning of November, is a wonderful time. And so I went to Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay to go visit Iguazu, the waterfalls there. And my next journey probably will be to Bolivia or West Africa and Dakar, Senegal. So if it's not this year, it's early next year. And Bolivia with the Car Senegal in the mix is the, the top two, I would say. And yep. again, it's one of those that I go to the airport, and if the flight's full, I don't go to that spot. The only thing that matters if people are going to live this kind of way is make sure you have a visa if the country that you're going to requires a visa. Uh, gotcha. Oh, yeah, good point. Good point. Uh, you've done this quite uh, quite a while to know that little trick. And yes. <laughs> you know, want to ask you, uh, I, I know it's probably like, asking which is your favorite pet but so far what has been maybe your your favorite journey or your favorite few locations that you've gone to do you have a couple that just really stand out to you uh, that is difficult to ask and <laughs> i do enjoy the mountains of the katakoram mountains feeding in the himalayas of northern pakistan and nepal again this is a negative brought out a great positive. I was in Kashmir and I, had, I was pulled off a bus because I was the only Western and I had several guns pointed at me for five hours of interrogation. But the outcome was I built friendships on this too. And I was in Kashmir uh, just seeing the mountains there. Uh, the trees at the tree line just right before the tree stop uh, it, at night with a full moon, just almost like people, uh, horses on their hind legs and just moving around because of the winds. Um, Nepal because of the Himalayas there and the base camp of Everest, beautiful part of the world. I truly enjoy Siberia because of the isolation that you feel there. Uh, Northern Russia, amazing. Eastern Europe is beautiful. Uh, and the Western country that I really truly enjoy besides the U.S. is Italy. Italy. I yeah. think Italy is because the mentality of the people, what I've learned is they forgive themselves for being human. And <laughs> Yes. I mean that with all due respect. They they take life serious, but not too serious. They can still enjoy the days, and I am very disciplined, but at the same time, I can take a step back and say, okay, today's a day of enjoyment. Right, right. So, uh, basically, almost one last question. Right now, what would be, if you haven't gone already, what would be that one place that you say, I have to do this? When all my journeys are done, I'm glad I went here. Have you done that yet, or is, is that still coming? And which is it? <laughs> I saw a quote one time, and I wish I could remember where it was, but I haven't been everywhere, but it's on my list. And <laughs> I would say the place that I would need to go to is Timbuktu in Mali, in Africa. Really? Yeah. Is it, it's, it's, just, it's just one of those names like Kathmandu. <laughs> you have to get there. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's in everyone's consciousness, right? Where everyone says it. Right? Where are you going? Timbuktu? Exactly. Yeah. And, it's, <laughs> and nobody, some people don't even know it actually exists. Yeah. And, Yes. Maybe because it's part of the desert, it might not exist for that long. I have to think about that. So the impermanence of things, I, I have to get on my horse and go because who knows what happens in the next right. couple months. Right, right, right. You know, it's, uh, you know what, what a great place. So uh, when do you think you'll be doing that? I, you know, I, I, with knowing me, I could do it next week. <laughs> <laughs> I really could. I could fly into Dakar, Senegal on Delta Airlines and go from there. And it does require a visa, so I probably obtain my visa in Senegal. Right. And that's where how I get my visas. I obtain them through the nearest country, and then I enter the country that way. So uh, I would definitely say in the next uh, year, year and a half, I could definitely see myself going there. Fantastic. Henry, thank you again. Appreciate you taking the time, and, you know, have a safe journey. No, my pleasure, and I, I can't thank you enough. This was a wonderful experience to be able to sit down and speak with you. Absolutely. Thanks again, and and, and big thank yous to Steve as well for setting all yes. this up. All yep. right. When I'm back in the U.S. Uh, after another journey, I'll just come down to your studio. Hey, sounds great. Sounds beautiful. Thanks, Thanks Henry. My all pleasure, sir. Thank you. You bet. Hey, well, this is Gus Summers, and you've been listening to The In Show, and we had in-studio guest, the global Henry Henry Birnacki, and he's out there globe treading right now, and give him a big thank you. And of course, visit him at theglobalhenry.com so you can catch up on everything he's doing. And of course, visit us at theinshow.com where you'll be able to see this interview and everything else that we are doing and have done and will be doing very soon. So, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Gus.
has left the building.